I, I have what? a question for Dr. Yusri, if I may. Um, yes, so okay. in the second in the second pa case, your patient complained of constipation. Were you um, not hesitant about using Arenumab in this patient who already has constipation? Did you consider other alternatives? The issue is here where I spoke with her about this condition, but the issue is she already has a chronic migraine and she already has a medication overuse headache. So which to start? If I give her triptizol, she's already on fluoxetine. If I started propranolol, she already have an anxiety and depression. So to have constipation with migraine or to have all of these and to treat, control her migraine. So I think here the decision was to address first her migraine, reduce the attack, and she's happy with the result that we reach. And her irritable bowel already, she's following uh, the psychiatrist and uh, regarding this condition and the constipation. As I know, it's a long run uh, side effect. We need the patient to use it for uh, the renomab for a long time. So we had this. Anyway, I informed about uh, this uh, side effect and we are following, hoping that it will not uh, affect the decision of the medicine. Yes, this, because other other CGRP based therapy uh, does not have the uh, does not have a precaution, or no, none of them have precautions, but that doesn't have to worry about constipation. But I think you 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 stated it correctly when you said you inform the patient, and if there is any worsening in constipation, then we can address that. In most patients, we will not see any worsening in constipation. Uh, there is one question to Dr. Yusri. Uh, would you consider changing fluoxetine to mirtazapine? The issue is she is uh, following with her psychiatrist. I spoke with him uh, regarding other option that we can use, but he told me that the patient already settled for this for years and she's already happy with this medication. So I didn't interfere with the choice of the SSRI that she is on. Okay. Mirtazapine is very good medicine, but it's very sedating. Uh, it's used as depressive medicine and same time causes sedation. So sometimes it's good for people, and elderly people with dementia and who has underlying depression. Okay. Uh, one of the questions here, does brain tumor cause migraine? That's um, I can answer that if you like. Um, yeah. Brain tumors can cause headaches. Uh, the phenotype of the headache uh, with the brain tumor uh, is uh, may include nausea or vomiting. But once you have a brain tumor, whatever headache starts is a secondary headache. So you can no longer call it migraine. Are there cases out there for of patients who were thought for many years to have migraines and then turned out to have a brain tumor? Well, yes, these are reported cases, but these people didn't have migraine from the beginning. They had a phenotype of migraine, but their diagnosis should have never been migraine. Are people who are having cervical disc prone to get migraine? I can answer this question. Yes, we have certain types of uh, headache like uh, migraine that can be triggered by a cervical, uh, by a cervical uh, disc or cervical disorder. It could be one of the causes that it can trigger migraine. So it's, there's a big difference between cause and trigger. Uh, cervical discs, uh, to the best of my knowledge, are never a cause of migraine. But any pain in the neck from cervical disc or otherwise can help, uh, as, as you said, Dr. Yusri, can help trigger a migraine attack. Yes. I That's see okay. a lot of people with migraine undergoing MRI of the cervical spine, and I sometimes wonder why. Uh, you know, there are things called cervicogenic headaches. Cervicogenic headaches are strictly unilateral, rarely, rarely, rarely bilateral. They have specific criteria. They're not migraines like usually. So... Um, you know, I see a lot of people coming, uh, patients coming from primary, primary care with x-rays of the cervical spine, with straightening of the cervical spine and this and that, and, and certain uh, uh, 
uh, osteoporosis or, or whatever degenerative changes, and all of a sudden their migraines or headaches are attributed to this. Sadly, this is not the case. If you have neck pain, if you have degenerative cervical uh, uh, spine pain, yes, pain can trigger the migraine just by having neck pain and so forth, but it's never a cause. Brain, uh, migraine is a brain disorder. The, the cause is in the brain. I read some study across by that 25% of migrainers present with uh, neck pain. So yep. neck pain could be a presentation of migraine. In most I, I, have, I have a poster in my clinic, Abu Bakr, you've never been there, but I have a poster in my clinic that shows you know, where the trigeminal nerve goes and connects and it extends into the face, into the sinuses, into the forehead, to the eye, to the nose and into the neck. And this, I think, just is a visual way of helping patients understand that sometimes when they start off with neck pain, that's the start of their migraine. How, how effective are occipital nerve block and sphenopalatine ganglion block for people with migraine? I believe you answered this question, but maybe we should emphasize it again. Yeah, I don't do sphenopalatine uh, ganglion blocks, but I know you do. Maybe you want to address that. that uh, yeah, and this tell you my bias and uh, many cases who tried many medicines and uh, haven't approved, giving them a pulse course of sphenopalatine ganglion block over the course of six, three to six weeks. For most case scenario, I see some effect on it. The MIDAS, MIDAS score are reduced in most of the patients by 50 to 60%. But it's time consuming. You need to bring the patient every two or three days to do the spinopatine block. And most of the time, the doctors, neither the patient have time to come to visit you. But I use them usually in acute phases every week. And if it's not effective, then I use it every two or three days. And, and I have uh, finger count patients whom are using sinopalatine ganglion block on a monthly basis now. You know, it's easier for you to do it maybe in the government sector because for me to get approval for this in the private sector is, is a nightmare. And that's part of the reason why I have been discouraged. Are, are most of your patients in the government sector or in your private clinic as well? Most of them are in uh, government, yes. Occipital nerve blocks are, are quite effective, uh, especially for status migranosis. This is where I find them to be most effective. Um, I recently, one of our nurses on the ward which kept, kept complaining and I just took her out into the, into the uh, uh, nursing supervisor's room. I put her in a chair and I gave her bilateral occipital nerve blocks and it broke her cycle. And I, I, think, I think it's something that the ER physicians uh, need to uh, also, it's very easy to administer. It's really something that can be very helpful in status migranosis when nothing else seems to work. This question is to Dr. Yusri. How about using Cymbalta or Effexor in people with migraine and comorbid depression? It, it will be a secondary treatment, but it will not be a regular, I mean, the first line of treatment Cymbalta and Effexor, it is not level A to start with uh, as a treatment for migraine. So we can use it, but to treat, to add, as add-on therapy for her migraine and the primary therapy for his associated, for her associated condition. Effexor, yes, is known as level, we can use it as um, if we have a migraine and a comorbid depression, but to depend on from the beginning, I think uh, it will be need to be case by case, but we cannot make it as a rule. Dr. Kayed, any opinion? I think uh, Dr. Yusri and I and you we are so very lucky that we now have the CGRP-based therapies that we can make statements like this. I mean, if somebody asked us this question three years ago with no CGRP-based therapies, uh, then we would jump on things like uh, the SNRIs, like uh, duloxetine and venlafaxine and so forth, because we didn't have anything better. You know, it was part of the oral medications. But now, because we have these CGRP-based therapies, uh, which are much more effective with less side effects, then, uh, then we go for that first. Now, of course, we, uh, we still need to treat the underlying anxiety or depression or whatever it is, and we may still utilize these medications, but it will be for the anxiety and depression rather than for the migraines. Uh, as you mentioned, Dr. Kai, anxiety and depression could be one of the symptoms or pre-monetary symptoms prior to the headache. 
So if this is the situation, then probably CGRP antagonists or preventive medication would alleviate the symptoms. Uh, you touched on this, Dr. Kai. Does chocolate and caffeine induce migraine headache? Maybe you need to reemphasize it again. Okay, so two different things. Uh, chocolate also has caffeine in it. Uh, I should, I should. Next time, in my, I will, I will include the caffeine content of chocolate, uh, not white chocolate. White chocolate is just sugar. Uh, so, in some people, but it's the. Let's talk about caffeine first of all. Caffeine usually does not trigger migraines, at least in my experience and in the literature. It's usually caffeine withdrawal that triggers a withdrawal headache that may trigger a, a migraine. So that's as far as caffeine. And therefore, I don't tell people to stop caffeine. I tell them one to two units of caffeine a day is acceptable. Um, going with what I mentioned earlier, less than 200 milligrams per day. Uh, when it comes to chocolate, it's basically only about 30%, three out, of, three out of 10 patients with migraine have a food trigger. Only about 30% have a food trigger. That means 70% don't. So I tell my patients, do look for a food trigger, but if you don't find one, don't be surprised. And now looking for a food trigger is not easy to do because we eat out and we, we have foods that have many different ingredients in it. But uh, you know, we, do, we do know what, uh, that some people are sensitive to these things. And then the other issue comes, is it a craving for chocolate? Yeah, uh, that is part of the migraine as a premonitory symptom, or is it actually a trigger? And, and some people, like Professor Peter Goldsby, is uh, very, very highly thinks that this is a, a premonitory symptoms, uh, uh, symptom, whereas other people still think it's a trigger. So there's no uh, uh, black and white answer here, uh, but uh, these, these are the situations we deal with. And we just tell patients, you have to be a good detective. I can just tell you about these things. You have to watch. You know, life is difficult as it is with or without migraine. You don't need to make it much more difficult by imposing unnecessary dietary restrictions. So look into it. If you find truly that it's a trigger, you know, you can test yourself over many days and weeks and months. If you find truly that it's a trigger, stop eating chocolate for two months and see what happens. I mean, if you can't stop eating chocolate for two months, then you've got a problem. <laughs> you can stop anything for two months, right? Um, stop it and then see what happens. And if there's absolutely no change in your migraine, then you know it's, it's, it's got nothing to do with it. And if suddenly you have a big change in your migraine, then you know that perhaps this was a contributing factor. And then you can make the decision whether to go back to it or not. Uh, one of the questions for caffeine withdrawal headache or migraine during Ramadan, what's the best prophylactic medication in your opinion? A cup of coffee at Suhoor, right? Isn't that what we said? A cup of coffee at Suhoor uh, um, reduces the chance of caffeine withdrawal, or even before Ramadan starts, start bringing down the numbers of cup, the number of cups of coffee and tea and, and, and caffeinated beverages that you have. I usually tell patients who come to me, I, I frequently have patients who are consuming maybe eight cups of coffee a day. And I say, okay, this is regardless of Ramadan. I say, okay, for one week, make it seven cups of coffee a day. And if you have to have the eighth, make sure it's decaf. So do it by weekly intervals because we don't need to precipitate uh, caffeine withdrawal. And if you do it in weekly intervals, it should not be a problem at all. Some people can do it faster. Uh, so um, my, my, uh, my advice is before Ramadan starts, start br slowly bringing down your caffeine intake. If it's a problem for you, then at suhoor you have one. Now, if you eat suhoor and go to sleep, it's gonna be difficult if you, if you chug a cup of coffee and try to go to sleep. So maybe um, that's not the best option for you. And I know actually, I have a friend of mine who does not fast or used to not fast because he just couldn't stop drinking coffee. Now that's between him and his God. Yeah. Okay, does much happiness cause a migraine headache? Um, so the, the brain of migraineurs is sensitive to change. Good change and bad change. So, an overexpression of emotion, whether good emotion or bad emotion, can make you more vulnerable to, uh, to uh, headaches. So I don't know of any specific studies mentioning this, but it can potentially be a trigger. But if I had to choose about uh, overly happy or not happy, I would go with overly happy and deal with the migraines. We got good medications for them. One of the audience asking, I have migraine headache, but I get different type of headache during uh, fasting. Uh, what the treatment be safe? So I don't know what she means, he or she means, um, you know, the fasting headache is usually a bland tension-like headache. 
But if you have underlying migraines, uh, the headache from fasting could still be a tension-like headache or it, the fasting could actual, actually trigger your migraine headache. So you just have to use whatever medication is specific for that headache phenotype. So if you think it's a tension type headache, then maybe you want to take a diclofenac uh, suppository. Um, if this is happening only in the beginning of Ramadan while your brain starts to get used to this new pattern of eating and sleeping, then maybe taking etorococcib at suhoor may be useful. If you think it's a migraine-like headache, then maybe uh, um, still a diclofenac suppositories might work, but you also may uh, choose uh, subcutaneous uh, sumatriptan possibly. Uh, one of the questionnaires, uh, can you use COX inhibitor every day during Ramadan for 30 days? You're not going to get medication overuse headache from using it every day. So yes, you can use it every day as long as you don't have a contraindication, a GI contraindication. But remember in that study from Palestine, uh, it was only effective in the first six days. So you could see a benefit on day one, day one of Ramadan and day one through six. But in, in the second week of Ramadan, there was not much a difference between placebo and heterococcin. So I'm not so sure if there will be a benefit from continued use. I mean, if you go with the medication over use headache types, COX inhibitor is one of them, right? It is, so but you know, the definition of medication over use headache is a change in the character of the headache and you have to use the medications on, well, if it's simple analgesics on 15 or more days a month for at least three months. So Ramadan is one month. So that should not be an issue if you don't have medication over use headache before. So if you, treat my status migranosis with the cocktail of medication along with uh, IV fluids. Would that be breaking fasting? I, I believe the... IV fluids would be breaking fasting, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably part of the treatment. We need yeah, probably... Then, yeah. then you'll break We need the a fact. religious guidance here. No, but, but it, it said from the fatwa, right? If you're taking something for, for uh, like IV fluids, IV fluids, I believe, the way I understood that fatwa would break the fast, yes. Mm. And if you're having lots of nausea and vomiting and you're, and you're dehydrated, then that day you're not going to be fasting. You're going to have to make it up some other time. And one of the audience is asking, where is your clinic? In Dubai. Both of you. Yusri, Dr. Yusri. Dubai as well? Dubai as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I think we concluded all the questions, most, most of the important questions. And it's now 9.15. Uh, if no one has any urgent burning questions, I think we're gonna conclude the talk. And thank you very much, Dr. Deep Kaid and Dr. Yusri for your interesting talk. We had a fruitful evening with headache, day two, and we can now manage headache during Ramadan easily, inshallah. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending this session, and thanks the organizers for organizing this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have Thank you time. for hosting us. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much, Dr.